I'm grateful to be able to share with you our today's Yin practice, uh, Thursday, 12th of July, 2012. So, while you observe what we're doing here is, uh, what is actually Yin? So many people ask me, what is Yin? I have no, you know, definition for myself, what you do, you guys do when doing Yin, and um, how does it differ from other more young styles of yoga like Vinyasa flow? And the definition that I really like is that yin yoga is an invitation or your personal secret call to dive into the depth of your individual intimate practice or sadhana of exploring your basic structural and energetic setup. Yin yoga emphasizes long-held passive stretches of the deeper connective tissue through which our energy channels flow and at the same time mobilizes and strengthens our joints, ligaments and deep fascial networks. And when we are holding postures for four to five minutes you really want to have the students come out very slowly uh, as the connective tissue really needs time to adopt to the changes that it undergoes. It's more plastic. And as you can see, they're also moving their arms freely around your neck. They're trying to find their personal best position, whatever gives them the feeling of freedom and opening. So here we're moving into Dragon from Ekaparada Mukhishwanasana, very slowly stepping forward, taking this huge step, and then staying into this asana for, I think we stayed in there for like five minutes, freeing up the hip joint, making sure that our ASIS is not blocking our flow of the energy through the thighs and it's beautiful just to see how many different positions we have here with only like five people everyone's going into their personal individual opening the aim of yin yoga is really to connect you so deeply with yourself that you for yourself can feel what's your next step, what's your next move, what feels right for you and to learn to feel in your body the difference between tension and compression. So here we're going into shoelace pose which a lot of students find very challenging. So. With this group it was pretty easy. People were lucky to have no knee problems in this group. So usually you would adjust and um, move up to students and see what they need. But they all work so beautifully here. And just a really, really very quiet working on their edge, staying with all the sensations that come up for them, diving into the sea of bliss <laughs> that you usually emerge out of after four to five minutes. Or as my teacher Paul Grilly voiced it, uh, <laughs> the feeling we all feel when coming out of a long deep held posture. So here we're going into a shorter back bend. Optional cobra or as we call it in yen seal. Here almost everyone chose to adopt the position. And then here we are going into dragonfly. One student chooses to use the wall, the others were either using a back stretch or going into the leg stretch of the adductors. Here, one of my favorite poses, cat pulling its tail. And also here you see me moving around the room and just making sure that everyone finds his 
or her, and in, in our case, her really unique opening, and also the awareness of where sometimes we block ourselves or just because we hold the picture in our mind, how the position should look, neglect our inner sensations and to what they want to guide us to. Sometimes you have to attend to small things that arise like pressure in the knee or just give a little support as I do here. It doesn't necessarily always have to do with structural problems. Sometimes it's the energy that gets stuck so you also want to touch students or have them touch themselves whenever there's a need to. And as I said, really always offering space and time for them to really move out very slowly. Here we are all going into square pose. And that is one of my favorite poses for working with a group because you really have to take the time to work with each and every individual and finding their way of working around compression that occurs in the front of their hips um, or the trochanter banging against the hip socket itself. So you see me here offering suggestions for each student what they can try asking them if they feel tension or compression and working with props. A lot of people that, especially people that come from a stronger, they have this kind of, you know, almost fear or disgust to use props as if that would make them inferior beings. And I agree that there is a certain reason of not always using props, especially when it comes to the energy flow. But when you're doing yin, you really want to prop up the body to be in a comfortable stretch so you can stay securely and safely four or five minutes in a long deep hold and that in itself is a certain kind of challenge for certain types of students. So talking and communicating is one of the most essential features of a yin class. The student communicating with itself and also reaching out to the teacher whenever something arises so we can come around and help you guys with your adjustments that you need. Slowly coming out here one side, going into counter movements, internal rotation, and then moving on to the other side, making sure that we tend to the differences in our hips from one side to the next. Our sides can really be very different, dif different and uh, that's not a problem in itself, it's just that we want to learn how one side differs from the other. So slowly closing the practice here, moving out of square pose, taking our time, and then offering the students one gentle back bend here in table. So that we activate our central meridian, getting ready for activity as this class was being held in the morning. And here you see me giving a little bit of support during Shavasana. Also feeling into the body of the students and what they need right now in this very moment. 
what kind of touch, working with the three different kinds of touch of Ayurveda and activating marmors, nadis or just doing something as I do here using a blanket or a towel to playfully loosen up their muscles and just offering them something that really feels good. Thank you. Namaste.